In the course of our previous lectures, we've discussed the basic assumptions of relevance theory. And now, we will try to show how particular aspects of language can be explained in relevance theoretic terms. Today, we'll discuss the pragmatics of conjunction. According to logicians, the meaning of conjunction is given in the truth table. So now you can have a look at the truth table and study it. And then you will notice that the conjunction operator forms a conjoint proposition which is true only if both of its conjuncts are true. In other words, we may say that the logical operator of conjunction is truth functional. The truth of a conjoint proposition can be predicted on the basis of the truth values of its conjuncts. The question that arises is whether what we know about conjunction in logic can be applied to the natural linguistic counterpart of it, that is the word end. In other words, the question is whether the conjunction end is truth conditional. So first let us have a look at uh, some examples. If you consider the first of them, John likes oranges and Tom likes bananas, you can notice that, that the order of the conjuncts can be reversed and obviously the meaning will remain the same. So the order of the conjunct does not affect the interpretation of the utterance. However, if you look at the following two examples, the situation is more complex. So Jane got on her bike and rode down the path. Uh, in this particular utterance, or in this particular sentence, the conjunction operator uh, implies some temporal relation. So first Jane got on her bike and then she rode down the path. If you look at the next one, the road was icy and he slipped. Uh, you can easily notice a causal um, relation, that is, the road was icy and that was the reason and because of that he slipped. The order of the conjuncts cannot be changed without dramatically changing the meaning of the whole proposition in the case of these two examples. So the question is whether these temporal and, and causal connotations are part of the meaning of and and they can be somehow accounted for, or whether and is ambiguous between at least three different senses. That is, pure conjunction, the meaning and then, and the meaning and because of that. If we accept the interpretation of lexical ambiguity of and, then we will inevitably face numerous arguments against this approach. So, for instance, uh, lexical ambiguity is language specific. If you consider the English word bank, uh, it is ambiguous. It means, um, for instance, a, a financial institution and just the edge of, of a river, the, the shore of a river, only in English. If you consider the Polish word, uh, word zamek, then again, um, its multiple senses appear only in, in Polish, uh, whereas the connotations carried by conjoint utterances, that is, temporal relations and causal relations, seem to be carried in all languages. So it is not just uh, the peculiarity of English. Now, the, uh, another argument might be that uh, the connotations can be cancelled without contradiction. If you look at the first sentence, Nigel left because the band started playing but there is no connection between these two facts, then you, you notice that the, the utterance of the sentence is uh, not acceptable at all. But if we say the road was icy and he slipped but there was no connection, it is possible to uh, accept the sentence. So it is, it is not uh, contradictory. Okay, thus the connotations that are somehow conveyed are not linguistically determined but depend on the context. Mind you that because there's also some kind of conjunction. 
uh, perhaps it is not con truth conditional, but it is still a conjunction. So, um, again, this is an argument against um, the interpretation of and as ambiguous, because the temporal and causal relations do not seem to be part of the linguistic meaning. Another argument against lexical <clears throat> ambiguity is that the connotations, that is, tempor of temporal relations and causal relations, arise even when end is replaced by a pause or a full stop. So Jane got on her bike, she rode down the path, so still um, the chronological order is the only possible interpretation here, but mind you that it is not encoded, so it cannot be part, it cannot be an inherent part of, of uh, end. Then the connotations conveyed by conjoined utterances are not restricted to the temporal and causal uh, relations. And this is again a powerful argument because um, then uh, if you accept uh, lexical ambiguity, then there are no three senses uh, that, that um, you choose from, but numerous other senses. So actually uh, it, it seems that it is an open-end class. So here, here are some examples. Simon was in the kitchen and there he was making bread. Jane fell into a deep sleep and during this time she dreamed she was a seagull. The window was open and coming from it there was a draft. Of course we can just skip out all these expressions in the brackets and they will be simply inferred. Simon was in the kitchen and he was making bread. Jane fell into a deep sleep and she dreamed she was a seagull. The window was open and there was a draft. So um, as you can see these are not exactly temporal relations nor are they causal relations uh, which means that um, that, uh, that and has to be interpreted as multi-ambiguous. So perhaps we should consider an alternative solution of the problem that is uh, some kind of pragmatic interpretation and first we'll start with Grice's uh, explanation. So again, um, if you look at the example you can notice that uh, uh, this is not a, a typical logical conjunction because you cannot reverse the order of the conjunct without altering the meaning of the whole proposition. He took off his boots and got into bed. He got into bed and took off his boots. Um, so they are just completely different uh, chronological orders. Grice claims that the difference uh, between the meaning of sentence 1 and sentence 2 can be accounted for pragmatically. So he believes that uh, a, um, a sense additional to the logical truth functional sense should be assigned to the uh, conjunction and. And uh, this additional sense uh, is derived on the basis of the speaker's adherence to the maxim of manner. So maxim of manner says be orderly, which means relate events in the chronological order. And if so, then we may assume that if the speakers abide by the maxim, they simply uh, relate events as these events occurred uh, in reality. Thus, this is the kind of conversational implicature, I mean this additional sense uh, of and is a conversational implicature based on the maxim of manner. So the understanding of sentence 1 and sentence 2 as communicating different sequential orderings of the actions is to be attributed to the maxim of manner which says, which instructs you, be orderly. So the semantics of and does not diverge from that of the logical operator and the chronological understanding is arrived at pragmatically as a generalized conversational implicature. I hope you remember that this kind of implicature is called generalized because you do not need to know the context of the utterance to derive that particular sense. 
um, and it arises because the speakers comply with the maxims and not flout them. So mind you that that kind of interpretation allows Grice to maintain the minimal semantics of and, so it is just a logical operator as it is in logic, and the additional sense is derived pragmatically as a generalized conversational implicature. The, the problem with uh, Grice's account is that it successfully explains uh, only temporal relations, whereas a pragmatic interpretation should encompass a much wider range of conjunctive relations that appear in speech and that are certainly not temporal sequences. And here um, what follows are numerous examples of such relations. So he handed her the scalpel and she made the incision. Obviously you may claim that it is temporal because then it is and then she made the incision. But mind you that the additional sense here is that she made the incision with the scalpel that uh, he had handed her. So uh, this is the meaning that, that you derive from that. We spent the day in town and I went to Harrods. So it is not that we spent the day in town and then I went to Harrods. It, it is we spend the day in town and in the course of the day we spend in, in town, I went to Harrods. She shot him in the head and he died instantly. So this is perhaps a causal, a, a causal relation. He left her and she took to the bottle. Now if you compare she shot him in the head and he died instantly, the um, a cost-consequence relation seems more obvious than uh, in the case of the next example he left her and she took to the bottle. That is, it is not uh, a typical or regular or the only possible way um, uh, that, that in, in real life. So this is just one of many possible scenarios. And uh, you can interpret the utterance that he left her and as a result she took to the bottle so that, that her um, alcoholism is a result of, of um, her being left by, by him. Uh, another one, she was short-sighted and she mistook him for a hat stand. Uh, she went to the yoga class and found it very calming. I forgot to hide the cake and the children consumed it. Now again, I hope you realize that even if you can trace um, uh, cause consequence, uh, a cause-consequence relation uh, here in, in all these sentences, um, th that relation is not so straightforward. It is not the most obvious consequence of it. If you, if you just leave the cake on the table, it does not necessarily um, mean that the children will consume all of it or, or something like that happens, or that if, if you go to the yoga class, uh, it does not necessarily mean that the natural consequence of it uh, is that, that you will find it very calming because you might be disappointed as well. So as you can see, the, the relations uh, here um, are really very subtle and it's very difficult to, to account of them in terms of the maxim of manner, that you are simply being chronological, that you are being orderly. On the whole, we would like to preserve the minimal semantics of and and account for the various relations that arise uh, in conjuncts in pragmatic terms. All the examples that we have presented so far are cases of asymmetric directional conjunctions whose meaning is affected by the order of the conjuncts. This means that we cannot reverse the uh, order of the conjuncts without changing the, the meaning of the whole proposition. However, if you keep in mind all these examples that we've just discussed, it, you can notice that they are pretty complex and the more examples you consider, the more fine-grained variations uh, among the connections you find. This means that the explanation has to be pragmatic uh, because communicators are calling on their general knowledge of how states and events in the world connect with each other or may connect in, uh, with each other. Not, uh, they do not always connect in, in one particular prescribed way. So um, 
Therefore, we know for sure that the explanation should be pragmatic. However, it cannot rely on just one maxim, that is the maxim of manner, which simply instructs us to be orderly. Now, another argument for the pragmatic account is that the same temporal and consequential relations arise when end is removed. Okay, so uh, we've already discussed that when talking about arguments against lexical ambiguity, but um, let us repeat it one more time, because if the same relations arise even if and is removed, it simply means that these relations are not a matter of the meaning of and. So this is something that we um, derive contextually. He handed her a scalpel. She made the incision. We spent the day in town. I went to Harrods. So as you can see, these utterances, these sentences, are interpreted in the same way as uh, the equivalent utterances uh, with the conjunction and between uh, the constituent parts. I hope to have convinced you that uh, uh, the meaning, the additional meaning of and should be interpreted pragmatically. However, the choice is between Grice's approach that views this additional meaning as a generalized conversational implicature, or the view proposed by relevant theories who claim that it is part of pragmatic enrichment. I hope you remember that pragmatic enrichment is uh, one of the processes uh, building up the explicature. So this uh, is a process that contributes to the derivation of the explicature, that is, explicit meaning. So the question is, are the conjuncts truth conditional implications? Do they contribute to the proposition expressed of utterances of end conjunctions? In other words, does the pragmatic inference contribute to what is said, that is, the explicative view, or is it an implicature? This is Grice's interpretation. So first I would like you to consider the following uh, utterances and in these utterances and is somehow embedded um, under the scope of some other logical operator. So either he left her and she took to the bottle or she took to the bottle and he left her. Okay, so the conjuncts differing in order are embedded in the scope of a logical operator. This is a disjunction here. Another sentence. It is better to do your PhD and get a job than to, to get a job and do your PhD. So this is a comparative. Mind you that they are logic, logically equivalent as a conjunction, as a logical conjunction. They are logically equivalent. Uh, to do your PhD and get a job is equivalent to get a job and do your PhD. But obviously they differ in meaning. The whole, the, the meaning of, of the conjunction is different. He didn't go to a bank and steal some money. He stole some money and went to a bank. So this is, uh, here the, the, the conjunctions are invented under the scope of uh, the negation operator. And I hope you can notice that the chronological order is part of the meaning explicitly conveyed here. So we may conclude that in the examples discussed above, the order of the conjuncts is crucial for the interpretation of the proposition. So in other words, the two conjunctions in each example differ from one another in respect of the temporal and causal orderings understood to hold between the events described. That is, the relations make a crucial contribution to, to the proposition expressed. If so, then they are part of the explicit meaning. So we may conclude that the relational inferences are pragmatic aspects of explicit content rather than implicatures. So I would like to convince you that, in fact, the relations expressed by and, I mean this additional relations, are part of the explicit meaning, 
on the basis of, of this example. So here we will discuss both the implicature of, of a particular utterance and its explicature. And then you will see, hopefully, that uh, the interpretation of and is part of the explicit meaning. So the context of uh, this encounter is that Bob has broken his leg and then Anne asks a question. Are you entitled to accident compensation? Bob, well, a manhole was left uncovered and I fell in. So what Anne derives from Bob's words, from Bob's utterance, is the implicature that he is entitled to accident compensation. However, to derive this uh, implicature, N must uh, supply a highly accessible contextual assumption. If you fall in a hole because of a manhole cover being left off, you're entitled to accident compensation. So, coming back to the proposition expressed um, in, in the utterance by Bob, a manhole was left uncovered, and as a result, Bob fell in the hole. Okay, so this is how Anne is to understand Bob's utterance. So Anne, first, before she uh, derives the implicature that she that the Bob is entitled to accident uh, compensation, first she has to understand properly the explicit meaning of Bob's utterance. So, she has to um, accomplish the process of pragmatic enrichment, and this is a cause-consequence enrichment of the logical form necessary for the implicated conclusion to be inferentially drawn. So, a manhole was left uncovered, and as a result, Bob fell in the hole, which means that now we know that Bob is entitled to accident compensation. So. I hope you can see that what constitutes the exclusively implicit message here is that Bob is entitled to accident compensation, whereas a cost-consequential relation between a manhole cover being left off and Bob falling in um, is just uh, part of the explicit meaning that has to be inferentially derived. So it seems that now we can conclude that, uh, in fact, uh, the additional sense of and is derived pragmatically, but it is not a conversational implicature, but part of the pragmatic enrichment. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that pragmatic enrichment is restricted only uh, by the considerations of relevance. So it is not restricted um, in the way that uh, the maxim of manner is, which says be orderly, be perspicuous, and that's it. Okay, so you can account, you are somehow limited in, in, uh, in your interpretation, because you can only account for temporal relationships, perhaps cause-consequence relationships, but all those uh, more complicated relationships just go unaccounted for. But with the pragmatic enrichment, you can explain absolutely everything because uh, the only uh, constraint that is imposed on your interpretation is relevance. Now I would like to proceed to the discussion of the relationships uh, between juxtaposed sentences. Um, it may be the case that all the conjunct relations are captured by non-conjunct counter counterparts, but the converse is not always true. There are relations that can be communicated by the use of juxtaposed sentences, but which do not seem to be communicated when the same sentences are conjoined by and. So, for instance, John broke his leg, he tripped and fell. John broke his leg and he tripped and fell. I hope you can see the difference. So if I say John broke his leg, he tripped and fell, it means that the fact that he tripped and fell is the cause for his breaking uh, the leg. Whereas in the second sentence, John broke his leg and he tripped and fell, first he broke his leg and then he tripped and fell. Or perhaps. 
um, the fact of breaking uh, the leg caused his tripping and falling. Then another example. Max didn't go to school, he got sick. So again, you ask if explain by means of the second sentence why Max did not uh, go to school. Max fell asleep, he was tired. Again, the same situation. So the second uh, sentence provides an explanation of the first, of what you claim in the first. Max fell, he slipped on a banana's skin. Okay, again, an explanation for Max's accident. So we may say that the typical relation between juxtaposed sentences is that of explanation. Now what distinguishes explanation from other types of information is that it starts with what is taken to be a correct description of the state of affairs and gives account of what necessitated or constrained this state of affairs. So in other words, we uh, provide a possible reason or an enabling condition for a particular state of affairs. It seems that the explanatory interpretation prevails in uh, juxtaposed sentences. Could you just have a look at the next example? Max can't read and he's a linguist. So and here represents some kind of contrast, implies perhaps some kind of, of, of contrast, so we may say that expresses adversative, an adversative relation. But look at this one. Marx can read, he's a linguist. Now, this is contrary to what we know about uh, linguists. At least they can read, they are capable of reading. So the explanation runs counter to the standard assumption and there is no linguist linguistically encoded content that could override the stereotypic assumption. However, I would claim that if you come across two sentences like that, he can't read, Marx can't read, he's a linguist, you know, um, you're quite likely to interpret he's a linguist as a, some kind of uh, explanation for the first statement uh, perhaps you treat it uh, as, uh, as an example of irony, but still uh, the direction of interpretation um, is maintained. I, I just do not want to claim that uh, explanatory, explanatory interpretation is the only possible one. I would just want to say that it is dominant. Now, here are some further examples to, to study. He hit her and she screamed. So this may be uh, interpreted as a forward-directed cause-consequence relation. So he hit her and as a result she screamed. Uh, she screamed and he hit her. Again, forward-directed cause-consequence. But then we may have he hit her, she screamed. And it can be both ways, I suppose, either forward directed or backward directed. So he hit her, she screamed, she screamed as a result. But it may be, perhaps not very likely in that case, but it may be that he hit her, she screamed. So that, that's why he hit her, because she screamed. She screamed, he hit her. Okay, so again, it may be either forward-directed cause-consequence or it may be backward-directed, then explanation. Uh, she screamed, he hit her, you know, so that's the reason why she screamed. Or she screamed and then he hit her, okay? Um, now, he handed her the scalpel, she made the incision. So here it seems that only forward-directed cause-consequence interpretation is possible. He left her, she took to the bottle. This is uh, less certain, I, I believe, because it can be he left her, she took to the bottle, as a consequence, but it may be he left her, and then the explanation, she took to the bottle, you know, and, and he just uh, could not cope with her alcoholism. So both the cost consequence and the fact explanation interpretations are compatible with common sense assumptions. Neither seems preferable to the other. So obviously it is a matter of context which, uh, which of them is, is chosen. Now if we are back to the example that we've already discussed, 
Marx can read. He's a linguist. So this one, this one is not plausible. I mean, the situation is not plausible. So let, let's make it uh, slightly more um, uh, plausible. Marx can read, and he's a street cleaner. So again, forward cause consequence, which means that because Marx can read, he is a street cleaner. Marx can read, he is a street cleaner. Uh, again, can be just the same interpretation. Or alternatively, it might be Marx can read, you know, he's a street cleaner, so what to expect of a street cleaner? That's why he can't read. Uh, or Marx is a street cleaner, he can't read. So a typical I would say that here, um, typical explanation. So Marx is a street cleaner. He can't read, you know. So who, what else can he be? We can explain uh, this dominance of explanatory interpretation in juxtaposed sentences by um, our features as human beings. So it seems that we are explanation-seeking creatures. When we register a new fact or a new assumption about the world, we look for an explanation for it. Either the world is a vast causal nexus, or our mental representation system has evolved in such a way as to reflect this. Or the world is just the totality of facts, but we have developed this highly effective way of representing it. So we go in for organizing our interpretations in terms of cause-consequence relations. Now, while nature may a, or may not be a system of causes and, and effects and consequences, it is not a system of explanations. Explanations are the products of minds. Explanations are meta in relation to causes and reasons. They are answers to questions why and how. So, in other words, cause-consequence relations seem to be natural in the sense that they do occur in the real world. Now, fact-explanation relation is not something naturally occurring. It is the effect of our processing to uh, two separate facts, joining them, okay? So it is a cognitive activity, in other words. So it, this is what is meant by meta, okay? So they are the products of the mind. So that they are not out there for us in the world to, to notice them and to, to pick them up somehow and to relate one to the other, but uh, they are the, the effect of highly complex cognitive processes. Uh, we are try, trying to remember that uh, we are trying to answer the question why the, the relation of uh, explanation does not arise in uh, conjunctions but only in juxtaposed sentences. But we, before we can answer that question, we have to explain the, the nature, the very nature of uh, explanatory relations. So this is going to be a digression and then we'll be back to our uh, original question, but now I'd like to present uh, the taxonomy of explanatory relations between facts. So um, there is a formal explanation, and this formal explanation um, specifies what constitutes X, that is, a particular thing. There is a material explanation uh, which defines the means by which X came to be, there is a final explanation which explains the purpose of X, and there is an efficient explanation uh, which provides the immediate trigger for the occurrence of, um, of X. And now let us illustrate these types of explanations. So, um, uh, could you please consider the utterance, the chicken crossed the road. So, what does it mean? The, chick the, the chicken crossed the road. The formal explanation uh, would be she was on the east side at 2 o'clock and 10 past 2 she was on the west side. So this is what constituted her cro its crossing the road. Now, so this is the answer, mind you, this is the answer to the question how do you know that the chicken crossed the road? The road? Now, the next 
type of explanation is concerns the means by which um, she cro uh, sorry the, the chicken crossed the road. So she hopped like crazy for ten minutes. So how did she do it? Okay, and um, then she wanted to join Elmo on the other side. So why did she do it? And Elmo told her to get on over or else. Again, why did she do it? The immediate trigger for the occurrence of, of acts. So mind you that uh, all these sentences that follow the chicken cross the road are explanatory and they involve the citing of a cause, reason or enable, enabler. But you cannot uh, join these sentences with the previous, the original sentence, by means of the logical operator end, because explicit conjoining will destroy the explanatory power. So you cannot say the chicken crossed the road and she hopped like crazy for 10 minutes. It simply does not work. Um, so the relations representing the four types of explanation are precluded by N conjunction. So now uh, implicitly we've answered the question uh, that the relations uh, that arise between juxtaposed sentences which typically are the relations of conjunctions uh, uh, sorry, that which typically are the relations of uh, explanation cannot uh, appear in conjuncts okay, because they are precluded by and conjunction So now let us uh, one more time go back to this property of our cognitive system, to this meta feature, I would say. And, and this will help us to ex explain our drive for explaining. So taking, taking the second utterance as explanatory of the first is the first strategy tried and it is maintained even if far from satisfactory. So this is for instance the case with uh, Max who cannot read uh, and he is a linguist. So Max cannot re read, he is a linguist, you know. So this drive for explaining follows from a fundamental organizing principle of our cognitive makeup which requires that our representations of individual state of affairs reflect them as embedded in a mesh of causal relations with other states of affairs. A representation that cannot be f integrated will be found irrelevant. I hope, if it, if it sounds too academic for you, I hope you remember um, when we introduced relevant theory and, and then we discussed the situation of uh, someone who wanted to sell a printer and uh, visited uh, the office of this uh, uh, potential uh, client and uh, then in, in a way the person wanting to sell the printer was task oriented and was very likely to pick up um, particular details of the setting um, and neglect some other details of the setting. So only those that, that could be somehow integrated, okay, that, that were relevant uh, for the person. So that's basically the same story here, that, that we um, need explanations for something that, that is uh, brought to us and that uh, is of relevance to us. So one aspect is uh, this fundamental organizing principle of our cognitive system. But there is just another way of thinking about relevant information in, uh, in the case of juxtaposed sentences. Um, so the relevant information should be the answer to the question. The question tells the hearer what sort of information is desirable or relevant. So why P? P because something. So this is a kind of scheme. This scheme indicates that uh, the explanation is relevant. In juxtaposed utterances there are no explicit questions. Okay? Max fell. He slipped on a banana skin. When we register a new piece of information, Max fell, we standardly construct 
the same scheme, P because. So this is just the same assumption scheme. And the completion of this scheme will be relevant to us. So we may say that um, the idea of the implicit question in the case of juxtaposed sentences um, is related to this, to this fundamental uh, principle that uh, organizes our cognitive system. Okay? Um, we just want uh, various assumptions to create a coherent whole in our cognitive background, in our cognitive environment. So when we come across a new assumption, we want to know why. Okay, so even if there is no explicit question, we construct such a question and that explains why in juxtaposed sentences um, the uh, dominant interpretation is uh, explanatory interpretation. So today we've discussed the pragmatics of uh, end conjunction and we signaled the, the problem with juxtaposed sentences, that is, we tried to establish the dominant relation between juxtaposed uh, sentences. But there are further questions that we have to answer, and uh, these are the issues we will address in the course of our next lecture. So why certain relations possible in the juxtaposed cases are not possible in the end conjunctions? We partly answered that question. Uh, you remember that we, we said that uh, um, explanation uh, is an answer to the implicit question and uh, it is not possible to insert a question in an end conjunction. Simply end precludes the um, explanatory relation. But this is only part of the answer. We still uh, would like to know why it is so. Another question is, since the bid for explanations of observed and communicated facts is so fundamental, why is the first strategy pursued in the interpretation of juxtaposed sentences precluded from the interpretation of end conjunctions? And uh, finally, can all the pre precluded relations be understood as cases of explanation? How about exemplification, for instance? Walls are breaking out all over. A and B have begun having border skirmishes. So as you can see, the second sentence is just an exemplification of the statement uh, made in the first. So in other words, there is a variety of elaboration relations, one of which is exemplification, which can arise between juxtaposed sentences but not between conjuncts. And now, how are these to be explained? So these are the issues we will be back to um, during uh, our next meeting. Thank you very much for your attention.